Amen. Well, hey, it's week four of this sermon series, Hear Her Roar, a biblically informed discussion on womanhood. And uh, I know that, that, that a number of people have told me they want to hear this sermon, but they're not here today, so we're recording it. You can watch it online later. I've uh, got some singles here today who came just, just because of the topic, uh, and that's, that's awesome. And so I want to, I want to jump right in. Um, we decided, uh, Pastor Billy and I decided over a month ago that we were going to tackle this topic of womanhood, a biblical uh, perspective on womanhood, because we just felt like it was timely regarding many things that have been going on in our country, nationally, and even globally, uh, and just, just this summer alone. Uh, so um, I've enjoyed this topic, but there, there's, some, there's some hot topics among, among the last four weeks of our discussions, and hopefully we've covered those in ways that have been encouraging to you. So today, singleness. About 12 years ago, I had the privilege of um, presiding over the wedding of some dear friends of ours, um, Laura, not her real name, uh, Laura uh, was marrying her uh, now husband of 12 years. And we delighted in that, Lydia and I did. Um, we, we often have the privilege, the joy, as, a, as a, a married couple and as a pastor, we often have the joy and the privilege of, of counseling a couple before they're married. Um, we've spent... Uh, many hours counseling single people who, who want to be married and, and are, are, are frustrated at times with their singleness. Um, and then we at times have the opportunity, the privilege of counseling people once they've been married for a while. And so Lydia and I, I think, make a good team in, in, that, in that scenario. So, so 12 years ago, um, I had the privilege of marrying Laura to her now husband, husband this husband to Laura. And, and, and they really checked all the boxes that I just spoke of, or at least two of the three boxes that I spoke of. We had, we had spoken into their, life, their lives individually for years as single people, and then we got to speak into their life uh, pre-marriage and walk them through that. Uh, and, and then it was a delight when I finally had the, 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 the opportunity that Saturday night to, to pronounce them husband and wife. And so Lydia and I uh, had the opportunity six months later to, to meet with them, and I specifically, because I knew, I knew the struggle and the tension that, 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 that both of them individually had gone through in their single lives. Um, I... We, Lydia and I, asked Laura, now that you're married, uh, what are your thoughts? What will your counsel be? And, and I remember her saying it stuck with me all these years. And I've heard other ladies specifically say this. She said to, to me, to Lydia, she said, you know, being married is good. Six months into it. She said, being married is good, but being single wasn't so bad either. I wish I had realized that in those days. And it reminds me of the, the words of, uh, of good old Andy Bernard from, from The Office uh, when he said, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Um, Today's passage, Paul the Apostle elevates the status of singleness to the degree that at times we say, does he value singleness over marriage? I'm not going to try to answer that question for you today. I want you to answer that for yourself. But, but he elevates singleness uh, in ways that the church has, I believe, really struggled. Um, historically, the single per person has perhaps felt a bit second class in the church full of married people. 
And I believe that if we're going to overcome this, and if we're going to really align ourselves with the teaching, with the Apostle Paul's teaching on singleness, then I believe it's going to happen at a small group friendship level. A scenario where singles and marrieds can interact freely in community and not feel any sense of division or, 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 or dissonance. With that being said, let's jump right into the passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to read a, a bunch of the chapter, but not all of it. Follow along with me as I read out loud. Paul says, But I wish everyone were single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God, of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It is better to marry than to burn with lust. I think that's pretty self-explanatory what he's saying there. We're going to skip way down to, to verse 25 now. I encourage you to read the whole chapter. Maybe tonight, make yourself a cup of hot tea and and just, just absorb the entire chapter. But for now, we're going to go to verse 25. He says, Now regarding your question about the young women who are not yet married, I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in His mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. I want to point out real quickly here, Paul deals in terms of concession and commands in this chapter. He talks about concession and and he talks about commands, and he's, that's what he's saying here. He's saying, the Lord has not given me a strict command on what the, the single ladies in this church in Corinth should do. So there's some concession here. There's some freedom here. I'm going to give you my wise thoughts, but there is not an exact command regarding this. We'll talk more about that later. Concessions and commands. Again, middle of 25. I do not have a command from the Lord for them, but the Lord in His mercy has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will share it with you. Verse 26. Because of the present crisis, these underlines are my doing for the sake of emphasis. We'll talk about that. Because of the present crisis, I think it is best to remain as you are, which is, in this case, single. I think it's best for you to remain as you are. If you have a wife, do not seek to end the marriage. If you do not have a wife, do not seek to get married. But if you do get married, it is not a sin. And if a young woman gets married, it is not a sin. However, those who get married at this time will have troubles, and I am trying to spare you those problems. Verse 29, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, again, my, my, uh, my underline for emphasis, the time that remains is very short. So from now on, those, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. That's really counter to teachings that you've heard mostly on marriage. So let's read that again, because it seems strike. I mean, it strikes me as a preacher, like, am I supposed to preach that? Let me read it again. It says, so from now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Verse 30, those who weep or who rejoice or who buy things should not be absorbed by their weeping, absorbed, absorbed by their joy, absorbed by their possessions. No, they should not be completely absorbed by those things. Verse 31, those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them, for this world as we know it will soon pass away. Verse 32, I want you to be free from the concerns of life. So he's talked about the present crisis. He's talked about the time that remains is very short. And now he's talking about the concerns of this life. Going on, an unmarried man, this is the middle of 32, an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please the Lord. Verse 33, but a married man has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. 
His interests are divided. In the same way, a woman who is no longer married or has never been married can be devoted to the Lord and holy in body and in spirit. But a married woman has to think about her earthly responsibilities and how to please her husband. I'm saying this for your benefit, not saying this to place restrictions on you. Again, this is for your benefit. This is not restrictive. And then the last phrase, again, underlined, I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with as few distractions as possible. The word of the Lord for which I give thanks. All right, let me point out some big statements here, summary statements that that Paul makes in this passage that are heavyweight. We're not going to project them. You might want to write them down, type them in your phone, but some big summary statements that he makes. The first one is this. I wish everyone were single, but alas, not everyone has that gift. He says that. Paul says, he, he, he considers the church in Corinth. If he were here today, he would consider the church, the, he would consider River Church. And he would say, I wish every one of you was single like me, but not everyone has this gift. Now, what obviously jumps out at us now is that the Apostle Paul is referring to singleness as a gift. And so the question that is begged is, why does he call it a gift? And what does that mean? And a number of you would say that it does not feel to you like a gift. I I know there are single people in the room who would say, this is not, doesn't feel like a gift. I remember years and years ago, I received as a gift an electric razor. You know, obviously I don't own one anymore. But I, I received an electric razor as a gift. And but what I really wanted was a new part for my bike. And it didn't feel like a gift. Because from my perspective, it's not what I wanted. You now you see the obvious uh, implication of what I'm saying that that in the in the same way. There is a period in life that some of us, if not most of us, go, go through where we say, I'm single, but I don't want to be single. And Paul just makes me angry when he calls it a gift. He can take this gift. I don't want this gift. And then again, as I've said, it feels, it feels sort of like Paul is saying it's, it's actually better to stay single. But it requires this, this long-term gift. All right, so then big idea, summary number two. Again, summary number one, I wish everyone were single, but alas, not everyone has that gift. Number two, he says, it is better to marry than to burn with lust. So he's making this concession. That's what he calls it. And then the third big summary statement is uh, that Paul says to remain unmarried but live a life of sexual sin while unmarried, while single, is of no value, is unrighteous, and therefore does not even factor into Paul's reasoning here. He's saying you are either going to remain single and celibate or marry and remain faithful to your, to your spouse. There is no other category in Paul's argument here. Again, Paul speaks of concessions and commands. Uh, this is a concession. This is my, my best uh, counsel uh, given my years of wisdom that I have accrued, Paul says that. He gives you concessions. 
Maybe you should consider being single for a lifetime. Not a command, a concession, a consideration, and then he speaks of, but this, on the other hand, is a command from the Lord. If you are married, he says, don't divorce your wife. That's a command from the Lord. Okay, concessions, meaning, look, there are legitimate options here. There's freedom of choice here. But in his counsel, he makes no concession for friends with benefits, for sleeping around, or casual sex, or, or hear me now, or sex that, that allows you to remain unmarried because you're scratching that itch, taking care of that need outside of marriage, so you don't have the urge to get married, or at least not quite the urge to get married. And Paul says, look, if you can't control yourself, go ahead and get married. Now, why is this important? Is it uh, because we, like the church is called to bash sinners sleeping around? Is it because we're super legalistic? And why is it important? Why did Paul say this? And why is it important to me that I draw this out? And the reason uh, is, is that, here's the point. Paul has this incredible, like, reverence for the single person who lives the life of celibacy. That he doesn't want to taint that at all by making like this other category of like single but active. And he's like, no, that's not even a category. He so, he so elevates, has such a high degree of, of reverence, Paul does, respect and, and awe for this, this Christian person who is single. To, to the degree that Paul doesn't want to, to taint or, or defame that high calling, that special gift, by, by mixing up the rules or watering down the honor, by confusing, uh, with confusing acts of uh, sexual immorality. He doesn't want that to factor into the equation. That, that is not an option here. That is not one of the concessions that Paul makes. It's kind of like if somebody won a really special golf tournament, and, then, and you're like, wow, like, we honor you. We revere you. You, you. you have this place of honor, and then you find out that they cheated on the ninth hole. And, and, you, and, and you're like, well, that's not a category that we have. We... we honor the winner of the PGA Championship and the U.S. Open and the British Open because they did it in a way according to the, the metric or the, the rules that have been, have been laid out. And, 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 and Paul wants to elevate this, this, this single person, this, this, this person who remains celibate, hard though it is at times. He wants to honor and revere. Now the big fat question in the room, though, that I want to tackle is, why would God want singleness for you at this season of your life? Doesn't he know you want to get married? And we'd say, well, of course he does. And, well, why would he not give you something that seems good for you? And, and something which, which you, you want to so badly, and how could that be good that God would choose at this stage, if not for your lifetime, how could that be good that God would choose to give you that gift, the one that maybe you didn't, didn't put on your wish list? He is not holding out on you. He, he is not some cosmic sadist who who enjoys uh, your pain. God, this is a, an age-old ethical question. Um, does, does God somehow enjoy seeing pain in his creation uh, played out? And, and, and the, I, the, the answer from the Bible is clearly no. He, he, he hurts when we hurt. In fact, Jesus coming to earth was because he was so concerned by our hurt that he wanted to feel it, experience it on his own. So, 
Again, the question is, why might God ordain singleness for a season and for some? Why might he ordain singleness for a lifetime? And the answer is clearly in this passage. The answer goes something like this. There is a present crisis or a present distress, Paul says, that should be factored into the equation when a single person seeks to get married. What is this distress? What is this uh, crisis? Uh, it could be interpreted, uh, and, and, and rightfully so. It, it, in fact, this is the most common um, interpretation. It's not the one that I mostly hold to, though. But the most common interpretation of this passage I have to be careful here, but the, the most common interpretation of this passage is that Jesus is coming back soon, and therefore like the, 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 the time is imminent, the time is short, there is a crisis, the, there, there is a, a distress that should be factored into the equation because Jesus is coming back soon. And, and I continue to hold to that truth, that biblical truth, that in light of eternity, Jesus' coming is not only imminent, but it is soon. I embrace that. I believe that. But if, if as a single person, that is your motivation, verse 29, the time that remains is very short, then the trouble with that motivation is Paul wrote it 2,000 years ago. And so, like, you could have been married, what is that, 20 times at least if you lived, if you lived to be 100 is that right? 20 times 100 is 2,000, right? Yeah. Okay. So you could have done that 100 times in 2,000 years. Um, 20 times in 2,000 years. So is that what Paul means? And, and, and maybe it is. In fact, certainly to some degree it is because Paul's theology was always about, again, in light of eternity, Jesus', Jesus return is imminent, meaning it's going to happen. There's, you take it to the bank. Number one. Number two, in light of eternity, it's going to happen soon. And so we should always be leaning in, always be pressing in, always believing that Jesus is coming back soon. I want to be ready. I want to be prepared. I want to be about his business. Certainly, certainly that is true. But there might be, I think there's a, 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 another meaning. It could also mean that for you as an inv individual who wasn't following Jesus for a season and now you are following Jesus for you, your life is short. And, and there are things that Paul wants you to get right in this brief 70, 80 years that you have on this earth. Now that I'm 53, I'll, go, I'll give us 90 because I want to live a bit longer. But this, this, this amount of time that you have left, that, 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 that it's, it's relatively brief. And Paul, he says there's some things that are really important that you get right. Yea, uh, yes, uh, even more important than marriage. These two verses, 26 and 29, they say this, because of the present crisis, uh, I think it best to remain as you are. In verse 29, but, but let me say this, dear brothers and sisters, the time that remains is very short. And then we're not going to project it yet, but he goes, he goes on, he says, so, or, Therefore, because of this is true, so, and I know, I know because some of us are um, single and a bit cynical as well, and I, I get that. Like, you may like, I hope the so is like, so what? I want to get married anyway. Um, if time is running out, all the more reason to get married. Let's get married soon. But let's see what he says, what Paul the apostle says, he says, because of the present crisis, because the time that remains is short, then he goes on with the so. We're just rereading the passage we read earlier, and he says this. He says, go on to verse, uh, the, next, the, next, the next screen. So, from no, now on, those with wives should not focus only on their marriage. Those who weep, rejoice, who buy things, should not be absorbed by their weeping, absorbed by their joy, absorbed by their possession. Those who use the things of the world should not become attached to them, for this world as we know it will soon pass away. And again, what I am pr uh, proposing is that not only does he mean that Jesus' imminent time till he's coming is short, but I believe he's also saying your physical life on this earth is passing away. Get it right. Don't 
miss the most important thing. So there's something here for all of us, honestly. Paul says this, not just to singles, but for every one of us in this room. Paul says, don't solely focus your attention on being married or on getting married. Maybe one or two of you or maybe a few of you tripped on your way into the room, scanning the room to see if that single person you're hoping was going to be here today is here, in fact, today. And, and that for you is, is it's a, maybe a distraction. And he says, don't just solely, only focus on that. But he goes on because it's for all of us. He, says, he, he also says, um, those of you that are sad, maybe you're going through a rough time in life right now, uh, Jesus gets that. Jesus went through sadness and sorrow and pain himself. He gets it. But, but, the word from the Lord is, don't solely focus all your attention on your sadness. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be raw. It's okay to be you. But don't, don't, don't pour all of your energy, all of your creativity into being sad. He goes on. On the other hand, those of you that are just killing it in life, right? Like, you just hit your stride. He says, don't Focus all your energy and all of your passion and all of your investment. Don't focus all of it on your success. Yeah, you're killing it now, but, but, but there's more important things in life that you want to get right. If you, if you have money to buy, don't focus so much on your buying power and the things that you're able to buy. Don't be absorbed by sorrow. Don't be absorbed by joy or possessions or your marriage, your singleness, the, the desire to be married. Don't be attached to all of the things that the world can offer you. There's probably not a person in this room that doesn't struggle with that. Whatever it is that's most important mentally, emotionally to you right now, you, you probably tend to just pour all of your affection and all of your energy. So maybe you have a, you have a child and it's like, hey, can we go play ball? And you're like, no, I just want to sit here and think about my sadness. You know? can, 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 we, can we go to the zoo today? No, I just, want to, I just want to sit here and think about my business and how I'm just, I'm just doing so well. And I need to work harder on it because clearly this is the one thing that's going well in my life. And so I'm going to, I'm going to focus. And, and Paul says, don't, don't take all of your attention, all of your creativity, all of your affection, all of your passage, and pour it into one thing because the world is passing away and we, your, your life is short and there's a an more important thing. And we're going to talk about what that thing is. Verse 32, I want you to be free from the concerns of this life. What are the, the things that he wants you to be free from? And that are the concerns of this life. Well, what is he trying to free you up to focus on at this stage in your life? I mean, is God not cool with marriage and possessions and money? And those of us who work for a living, is God not cool with that? Is he down on all that stuff? Because all that stuff like, pretty much defines who we are. Your marriage and your money and your house, your house payment, your kids, your retirement, your, your, your physical health. Like That's all, like in, all encompassing. That in total makes you, you. Is God not cool with all that stuff? And of course not. Those are, those are the gifts that he has given you. Every one of the things that I just listed, those are gifts from, from, from your heavenly Father above. They're good and perfect gifts, and he wants you to enjoy them. He just doesn't want you to enjoy them mostly because they are not the most important calling or goal in your life. See, the storyline of, story of your life is this. God has rescued you from the kingdom of darkness and delivered you into the kingdom of his Son, Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption, in whom we have adoption, in whom we have the forgiveness of sin. I don't have to tell you that this world is broken and, 
and, and on fire. And, and, and you run the temptation to either just, just go along with the world, just burn right along with the world, or, or the other option which Paul is calling us to, and that is to, to be an agent of Jesus in the midst of this world which is on fire, in, in this world in which everything is amiss. You can either engage in just the brokenness of the world, meaning like that's what you care about mostly. You care mostly about the issues and, 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 and the socioeconomic politics. And not that those things aren't important. There's a measure of energy that we have for those things. Or the morality or the, the lack of morality or your, your friend's choices. You can either mostly engage in that and just burn right along with the world like everybody else, getting mad and spun up. Or, or the storyline of our lives that Jesus has called us to is we can be an agent of Jesus, doing the mission of Jesus, and seeing your own soul saved from the fire in the process. Your life has a new storyline. If you're a Christ follower, if you have submitted your life to Jesus. Your life is a new storyline. And we must get that right. Or we are no good for anybody else in marriage. And marriage will only become another idol in one's life. And we're probably not ready to to, to, to parent either at that point. So we want to get this new storyline deeply ingrained in our being. But this is more than just a, just a cautionary tale. Um, Paul says the single person can live free from, quote, the complication of life. The complication of life. What does he mean by that? There are important matters in life, as I've said, that we need to get right, uh, of eternal value. And Paul says, look, uh, your work and your marriage, really important, not the most important, but those things can at times actually be a distraction. Your marriage can actually at times if not um, redeemed, if not lived out under the lordship of Jesus Christ, you could get married, it could become the most important thing, and that could possibly be bad for you. And growing up in the church, as many of you did, as I did, we, we, we scratch our heads and we say, how can anything be more important than uh, a spouse? You know, and a house full of kids, Right? It's God, family, country, right? Like, like it's, it's, it's right up there with God. And, and I, I think this is a tricky issue, that confusing issue that, 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 that needs explaining. If I don't get my heart right as a single person, in some cases that's what singleness, that's why singleness might be prolonged. If I don't get my heart right, then my marriage, my kids, idol, all my life might actually be jeopardizing rather than affirming and, and redeeming. How can marriage be a distraction in my life? Pastor Randy might ask. Um, how might it divide my interests? Verse 32, an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work. Verse 34, an unmarried woman can be solely devoted to the Lord. Mario was a friend in mine, a friend of mine in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, you know, no, you don't know. So that's why I'm telling you the story. Uh, Twenty years ago, I met him. I think something like that. Twenty something years ago, and Mario uh, ran a business, and Mario was single. He was a single man, um, and 
in running this new business, new to him, <coughs> he worked many hours every week. If you own a business, if you own a small business, you know how that, how that goes. Uh, he, he, he worked many hours every week, and, and then on, in addition to that, he would come down to our rehearsals at the Lobo Theater. That's where our church met. He'd come every Wednesday night, and he'd spend hours there working on the tech team, doing sound and doing lights and making sure everything was good for our Friday night and our Sunday morning worship services. And then sometime during the week, youth group would move around a bit there at, 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 River, at uh, City on a Hill, but he would, he would teach in the youth group. Um, and and he, would, he would disciple teenagers, you know, have lunch with them at their school or go to their their, 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 their games and <clears throat> go to their, uh, their, 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 their band performances. And he was just really engaged in our community as a single person. He was doing something with, with the church many nights during the week. And, and, then, and then after over 10 years of being a, a believer, because he, he, was in, he was a brand new believer when I first met him, 10 years of, of being married, he got married. Uh, 10 years of, of, of being a Christ follower, he got married. And, and at that point, he was, he was ready to be married, but I knew him for 10 years. Uh, I knew that he had a deep desire to be married, but he did not let that desire rob him of his opportunity to be undistracted. See, see some of us that are married and, and have kids... We are rightfully distracted by all of that, but some of us in this room who are single, you are nonetheless distracted, um, perhaps super distracted by your phone or Christian single mingle, whatever they call it, and checking on social media profile 20 times a day, and just, just like you're in a holding pattern, like one of these days I'm going to be married and then... I, I wrote down some, some lies that I read this really interesting article by Elizabeth Woodson, and one of, the, um, one of the lies that she wrote is that we equate singleness with being alone, like single and alone or solitude are like the same word, and they're not. And she also wrote that, that in the church specifically, we confuse marriage as being equal to Maturity is that you can't be mature unless you're married. <clears throat> I have never been, it's going to sound dumb when I say it this way, but I have never been a single woman. Uh, and we're, this is the sermon. <laughs> I knew we'd get laughs from this side of the, this side of the room. Uh, <laughs> How about that for out of context? Uh, um, and this is and this is a uh, and this is a sermon series on womanhood. Uh, but here's here's what, because this is such a precious topic, I want to be uh, be a bit vulnerable with you regarding just my own life, uh, my own. Uh, precious struggles that maybe everybody here can relate to, and maybe there's some application, I think there's some application to singleness. Um, and so it's a sacred moment here, and so um, I, I want to be, uh, be, be vulnerable and talk about like a, a precious sort of struggle that, because our struggles are real, right? Our struggles are real. So um, Maybe, maybe some of you who are married can relate to this as well, but I think it's like unto being single. I've spent portions of my adult life, probably even struggled with this as a kid, portion of my adult, portions of my adult life struggling with the sense of this impending or, or, or this, this, this nebulous fear, kind of like impending doom, but this nebulous fear that, man, I'm, I think maybe I, what if I miss out on life? What, what if I miss my shot? Um. What if I miss my personal opportunity at success? 
It's nebulous. It's fleeting. It sometimes feels like, like there's this train going by, and I'm, I'm going I'm to, I can't quite jump on. And it's at times like super unrealistic, and yet that doesn't distract us, right? We're like, even though it's unrealistic, I'm going to feel this way anyway to the point of sometimes being ridiculous. And, and so Jesus has um, been continually healing me of this burden and changing my heart, but it's just a struggle left unchecked. It is, it is a struggle at times in my life. So it, it leads to like questions that probably at that point in life don't even need to be asked because it's unrealistic. Like, oh man, should I, should I go back to school? Should I, should I buy a piece of real estate? Should I, should I move? Uh, should we have a sixth child? Yeah, not anymore. But those kind of like, what is it? There's something nebulous, missing. Can't quite put my finger on it, but I ought to do something to fix it. And the truth is, when we're in that state in life, what we're doing is we're believing a dirty little lie that Satan whispers in our ear. And, it, and it, that dirty little lie is this. I'm not enough. I'm not enough. And so some of you who are single today, you experience this same sort of nebulous doom. Like life is passing me by and I'm not complete and I'm, I'm helpless or I'm just waiting for someone to notice me. I'm waiting for my spouse to come and rescue me. And, and specifically single woman, um, what I want you to hear today is that in, in your struggle in your unmet desire to get married, hear me, you are enough. I think that's what Paul is saying here. I want you to get that into your brain. You are enough. <clears throat> your singleness isn't wasted. If you remove the distraction of, of, of the desire to be married, or at least, at least turn down the noise a bit. Jim Elliott used to say, I believe I'm quoting him here, wherever you are, be all there. Live life to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. I, it, it's a warning from Paul. Look, marriage, it can be distracting. And if you don't spend your, your time of singleness getting the storyline of your life right, then when you, when you move into marriage, and, and I, I highly recommend marriage, but when you move into marriage, getting the storyline of your life right is going to be even more difficult because it's just busy. Lydia and I have five kids, 31 years of marriage now. All of the last three decades when I've talked to younger people and single people, they don't believe me when, I, when I've said over the years, and it does get better, I'll tell you that, but over the years, like, I have little to no discretionary time. You want to learn a language? No time for that. You want to take up a hobby? Really hard to do without robbing your kids of, of their daddy. You, you want space to, to start a new ministry? It's just, it's just difficult. Young married fellow, a number of years ago, had his first kid, and he told me, like, he was like so broken. He told me like how he didn't have time for, um, for gaming. Like I'm so old, like, I forget what that even means sometimes. Like gaming to me, if you're my age or so, you, like, it, that means like going to Las Vegas and playing the, playing, playing the craps table or whatever. But he wanted time at night to game. What is that? Like game box, game cube, game boy, game, game, whatever. Okay, so he wanted to do that stuff. And, 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 and um, he just wanted to, I, this is almost a quote, he wanted to relax for a few hours in the evening, like the old times before he'd gotten married. 
And I just looked at him with a blank stare. I was like, I, I haven't had a few hours in the evening to relax since 1995, man. Like, that's, that's, that's just what marriage, like you wanted to be married, right? That's just marriage. Yeah. And, 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 and then, and then the, 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 the beautiful distraction of having another person in the home that doesn't think a bit like you. You know, like I, Lydia gets home from work, I get home from work, and she'd be like, do you think that we should paint this wall like maybe more of a mob and less of a pink? And I don't even know what mob is. I'm like, <laughs> I was like, honey, I, I tried, but I just can't care. I just can't care, you know? <laughs> and then I'll be like, honey, honey, do you, do you think we should, like, our next puppy dog, should it be, like, should it be a British lab or should it be a field-bred cocker spaniel? And she's like, which one sheds less? I'm like, well, that's not the point. The point is which one will serve us best in the duck blind. But, but <laughs> marriage, marriage is beautiful. It has served me well. But if you're single, which you may not realize, and what Paul is saying is it is, is work. It is distracting. Singleness is a unique gift that should be embraced for a season. You should live in the present, in the now, and, 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 and it should be embraced as a gift. And that doesn't mean that it will be immediately easy, but it will get easier over time. Here's a big idea. Big idea. The singleness is a gift of God that is uh, is a gift God has given some of you for a season in life and a righteous desire, singleness, that God has given some of you for a lifetime. And I want to celebrate that this morning. Let me say that one more time, and then we're going to look at what Jesus said about this. Singleness is a gift that God has given some of you for a season in life and singleness is a righteous desire, and we should hold it up on a pedestal as though it is, a righteous desire that God has given some of you for a lifetime. Matthew 19, here's what Jesus said. The disciples said to Jesus, we looked at this like week one. The disciples said to Jesus, if this is the situation between a husband and a wife, he was talking about how difficult it is to, to stay married. Jesus was talking about divorce and the, 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 the sin that goes on in a marriage. And, and, and the disciples say, well, if that is true, is it, is not, it, is it not better? Uh, it, it is better not to marry. That's what he, it's, it's made as a statement, but they're kind of asking, they're really asking, are you saying that it's better to not even marry? And, and Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word there's some debate theologically what he, what he means by that. I think he's saying the word that the disciples just said. What you just said, disciples, this word that you just spoke, that it's better not to marry, he's saying it, not everyone can accept that, but only those to whom it has been given. It's kind of repeating what we've been talking about today. For there are eunuchs who were born that way, um, and, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others, Others, that's really like a tragic tale. Um, and then there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. The one who can accept this should accept this. Okay, a few weeks ago I told you I wasn't going to unpack what it means to be a eunuch. I'm not going today to do to, uh, today either. But the la what, what he's saying is some people from 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 birth, maybe some some. Something about their physiology when they're, uh, I think that's right, when they're born, they, they, they never marry, and they, they never have sexual relations. Some people, tragically, something has been done to them, and then and the Jesus says, but there's a third category. There's a third category, and that is, and there are some in this room today, but there are certainly some in the church, in, in Christian life, who will choose ultimately he calls it living like a eunuch, 
choose ultimately to live a life of celibacy and singleness for the rest of their lives for the sake of of the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus says. And this will play out in different ways. You may be right in the middle of a long season um, where you've been, where you're moving from being convinced, I will marry. It's just a matter of time, I will marry. And, and, and perhaps you're moving through a season in life. I've seen this in some, some friends where you begin to move to the other end of the spectrum where you you may soon cross over this threshold and, and you'll be in this category that Jesus speaks of where, where you realize that your desire to be married is all but gone and you're very comfortable with being single for the rest of your life. And for you, and that's, not, that's, that's a very small percentage of, of, of the church, I realize that, but for you, Paul would say that is the best thing. Before you quickly dismiss that possibility, just think on the ways in which life is simple for you now. And, and, and Paul says, just consider the ways in which life could be unnecessarily complicated if you were to marry. I think that we, just, we need to create space in the church where we at least consider this. Um, finally, I'm going to wrap it up by asking you a few questions. And uh, really, really just, I think, three questions. And then we will we'll go to the table of communion and we'll celebrate Jesus and in, in how he has rewritten the story, the storyline of our lives. Here's the first question. Is the desire to be married distracting you from, from really making your mark, from really living in the present. Don't answer out loud. Just consider that. Is your desire to be married so strong and so overwhelming that it is distracting you? Number two, as a single person, are you leveraging this time in your life for the kingdom of God? of God. The fact that you have fewer distractions, maybe more time, although I don't want to put time burdens on you simply because you're, 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 you're single, but, but are you leveraging this time in your life for Jesus, for the kingdom of God? Are you using this as a good gift that God has given you for a real, unique purpose? I want you as a single person to thrive. I want you to, I want you to go on trips, but not just frivolous trips, trips with a purpose. I want you to, I want you to fill your cup personally, in ways that the people that are married sometimes just don't have the means to do. Uh, learn a language. I invest in a ministry at a deeper level than most of us are able to do. Get involved in serving a young mother who has decided to keep her baby in some kind of a crisis scenario. Are you leveraging this unique season in your life, this gift, though for most of you it is a temporary season, are you leveraging it for the kingdom of God? And last, last question. Might God be calling a few of you um, to a lifetime of singleness. I want there to be space for that. I want us to, as a church, honor and revere that as a, a really good choice for a few of us. 
Well, that's all we have time for today. I, I, I hope that is a blessing to you. I, I hope that uh, those of you that, that want to be married, I, I hope that you... Uh, I hope that you enjoy this season of life, but I do hope, I do, I do want for you marriage. I, I don't want you to think otherwise. Lydia and I, especially Lydia, uh, she prays for you as single people here at the church, and, and we really do. We're rooting for you, and we want the best for you. So the Lord bless you in this. Let's pray. God, we celebrate the fact that you care about our desires. God, we celebrate the fact that you, like a, like a good dad, you are concerned. Um, you are concerned over the details of our lives. You're not like a, like a coach who just wants us to get out there and win the game, but you are like a daddy. You are a daddy. You care, about, you care about the intimate details of our lives. God, I pray for us as a church today. I pray that, that we as singles and married people can, can, um, can interact in, in, in better ways than we have in the past, that we can be a church in which as married people we esteem the singles and as single people we esteem the married people and that we... We learn from one another and we interact in unique and, and beautiful ways. Would you do that in our lives? I guess that's called community. God, would you make us more deeply into a community, the body of Christ. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.